Hi, I'm Kaya. And I'm Joanna. And this is Starlet Citadel Reviews. Hi everyone, we're nearing the end of Season 3 of Starlet Citadel Reviews, which means it's time for our top games of the year. Uh, this year we are going to each be presenting our top three choices from the past season. So the first game out of my top three is Eldritch Horror, which is a challenging cooperative game. Now you may have heard me mention it before in our top thematic games of this year, which we released a little while ago, and definitely its theme is one of the things that makes it so strong for me. Now right from the very beginning of this game, it feels like all of your choices are really, really important, and I like that about this game. It also really delves you into that beautiful Lovecraftian world that I love. Uh, the theme is incredibly well integrated with the gameplay. The art and the components and everything plays into that really nice Lovecraftian feel. And it really does feel like you're leaping into this game for a full-on immersive experience in that world for the three or four hours that it takes you to play. Also, this game is sort of based, or inspired at least, by Arkham Horror, which is a larger Lovecraftian game but it is less fiddly, it has less pieces, I think the game design is actually tighter, and so it gives you this version of one of my favorite games that more people are going to be willing to play with me. You can play it in three to four hours, which is still a nice immersive romp in this Lovecraftian world, but it isn't the eight-hour epic that was Arkham Horror, so I love the place that this game has, has on my shelf. I can bring it out and people are more willing to play this Lovecraftian epic with me and I really enjoy wandering around in this world that has a theme that's so nicely realized. So everything Joanna says is true. I think uh, Eldritch Horror is a really great example of a well-designed, thematically immersive cooperative game. I've just come to realize that I'm not so much of a cooperative gamer. Um, I play games to pit myself against other players, to, to get into this kind of battle of minds and wits. And cooperative games are, are always a fun experience, but they don't really push those buttons for me. And so even really well-designed games like Eldritch Horror are just not going to be all that exciting. That being said, I do think it's a very strong game and it, it does hit the table a fair amount at my house because it is such a good social and interactive experience, even if it's not quite a real game to me. So the second game in my top three is a little bit different. It's Dragon's Horde. Dragon's Horde is a small game, comes in a little box, so it's portable and it's quick and it's quick to learn and it feels light. But in that 45 minutes or so of gameplay, there's a lot of strategy and a lot of nice resource management. So I really love that really cool combination. So I can bring this game out and I can play it in a short period of time, but I get a lot of game out of it, which I really like. I also love the components. I think the art is fantastic. It's got beautiful color choices. It's got great pictures of dragons. I really enjoy looking at this game. Also, it's got really nice little elements of quirkiness and humor. It makes me laugh. It's not just a pretty game with nice gameplay. It's got attitude, and I really like Dragon's Horde for that. Like Joanna said, Dragon's Horde is, is both pretty and pretty cute, and it's definitely got a lot of charm as a game. What I think is strongest about it is that it works really well as an introduction to resource management as a mechanic that doesn't have a whole lot of extra game around it. So you can use it to introduce players who are new to gaming to these mechanics. It's a really great family game. It does really well with, with children and with younger gamers. And I think it's a wonderful way to bring people to more complex, more challenging and bigger games while still being really interesting and fun to play in its own right. So my top game is Dead of Winter. Now, Dead of Winter is another challenging cooperative game. I do very much like my cooperative games, and this one is very challenging. Right from the very beginning, it's scary, it's fast-paced, you cannot sit back and let this game play out. You have to be working right from the very beginning, and at any moment, you could lose characters, your entire team could fall apart. It's very much a simulator of a zombie apocalypse world, and it tries to get pretty close to accurate as to what that might look like. It's very granular, 
It's very detailed. There's the stuff that you have to pay attention to in this game. There's so many little tiny things that you wouldn't think about that you might see actually in those zombie movies or in those zombie TV shows that you have to pay attention to. You have to eat. You have to not make too much noise. There's all these little tiny things you, you have to, uh, you have to keep, keep looking at, keep paying attention to. I love the components, beautiful game board, great color choice. I love the component quality. And I also love the fact that that cooperative mechanic, which I do very much enjoy, has sort of been turned on its head just a little bit because you do have to work together, but there's the secret objective and betrayal mechanics that are going on as well. So yes, cooperative game, but you've got that extra little bit layered on top of it, which makes it even better in my opinion. So this is a cooperative game that I can really enjoy, and it is because I think of that traitor mechanic that Joanna mentioned. Now this isn't unique to Dead of Winter, but the thing about this game is that it's so difficult already. It's so tense already. There is absolutely no margin for error. So that threat of somebody betraying you is so much scarier than it is in a game like, say, Battlestar Galactica, where you can often get pretty far even if you know there's a traitor with you and there are good ways of dealing with them. In Dead of Winter it just feels like the situation is so incredibly desperate that you all really really need to be cooperating, you really need to be working at your best, and I just find it delightful that that can be undermined and betrayed and twisted and made all the more challenging. This is a, a really 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 nice twist on that mechanic. So the first game on my top three of the year is Quantum. Now Quantum's a little bit of an odd duck in that on the one hand it feels like an abstract game where its central mechanic is manipulating these giant candy colored dice to give them different properties and different movement values based on which side of the die is up. On the other hand, it's got the rich theme and structure of a space 4x game. These two ingredients maybe shouldn't mesh as well as they do, but Quantum does a really, really excellent job of bringing two really different genres together. And I think this is because this is a designer designer's game. It is so incredibly tightly thought through and designed that there is not a single thing in it that's wasted. Every single move you take matters. Every single action contributes directly to whether you're going to win or you're going to lose the game. And there's never any sense that you're, you're sitting back and waiting for things to happen or that you're building up to something more important that's going to happen later. You're just moving in this incredibly precise and focused and and consequential way like you do in a lot of abstracts and what is often their strength but at the same time you do feel like you're in this rich world it's not just your blue dice against your opponent's red dice you're flying ships and you're conquering planets and you're taking over a sector of space and your opponents are unique and their political values are inimical to yours there's all this great sense of depth and immersion to it but it's a tight fast focused little game that plays in about an hour. Um, there's not really anything quite like Quantum. It might be a, a little bit hard for people to, to access or to get into because of that, but I think it's absolutely worth it and it's a, it's a real unique little gem. I agree. Quantum is fantastic and so incredibly unique. And I love the way that it rides the line between the abstract and the thematic. It's got a little bit of sort of hand wavy science to make you believe in the theme, but honestly, it, it does, it's not a stretch. It's not a challenge to believe that stuff because the game is so beautifully designed. It's really a joy to play. Uh, it really feels like the designers just went all out on this and everything is really tight. Everything has a purpose. Plus, I gotta say, the component quality is beautiful, which makes a difference to me. So not only if you've got this nice abstract with beautiful thematic elements that tie into the gameplay in a really nice way, but you've also got a really beautiful game to play with. So this game is very unique, but honestly, it's, it's a fantastic game to try out. The second game on my list is Alchemists. 
Uh, this is a Czech Games Edition game, and that publishing house has got my number in that their particular blending of theme and mechanics is one of the things that I love best in games. So I always really like their offerings, but I do think Alchemists is a little bit unique in the way that it blends technology and board gaming quite seamlessly, and also in the way that it integrates deduction into what's otherwise a pretty classic Euro game. Um, I love the deduction element. It's a lot of fun, and it's certainly the initial draw for the game. It's the thing that got my gaming group playing it because they usually kind of shy away from worker placements and similar designs. But as soon as I told them that they'd be using a grid to figure out potions, they were right all over it. Um, but the neat thing about the deduction is that it's not actually the only thing driving the gameplay. The biggest challenge that I've found with deduction games is that once you've gotten good at solving their internal mystery, once you've gotten a handle on how that particular puzzle works, they kind of start to lose their appeal because the tension and the challenge is gone. Well, with alchemists, you don't win by solving the mystery. You don't win by figuring out the alchemicals of the different ingredients. You win by publishing your theories and by proving to everybody else that you're smarter than them. There's this whole complex game that's actually built around bluffing and around building, you know, important theories off of dubious information and this whole kind of house of cards approach to getting your theories out there or debunking your opponents. It's highly interactive. Uh, it can get really tense. The last game I played, we had people yelling back and forth across the table about the theory of the ferns and how could it possibly be right. Uh, and it really does capture you and pull you right into that theme. So Alchemist is designed in such a way that it takes all of these detailed little mechanics and quite possibly fiddly bits and pieces and streamlines it together into this beautiful world that doesn't feel fiddly at all, which is fantastic. Um, I agree with everything that Kaya said about Alchemist. This is a really, really interesting game. And it's also a very unique theme. I've never really seen this done before. So it's got that humor. It's got that really interesting spin on academia. It's got this neat stuff that's going on. And even though it feels like the game is quite large and quite detailed, got lots of bits and pieces in it, it really doesn't get bogged down at all. Uh, and it's really quite a joy to live in that world. I really appreciate the amount of detail and the amount of thought that went into everything from the board art to the cards to the 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 rule book to everything that plays into this really nice world. Um, this is a really nice tight game and I would have it in my top three if Kaya hadn't stole it before I could get to it. Now all that love for alchemists aside, my top game of the year is actually Battlecon Devastation of Indians. I just can't get enough of this game. I, I can't believe how many times I've played it. It's certainly gotten more mileage than any game that we reviewed this year, and possibly more than any game we've ever covered. There are so many characters, and it's not just that they have different visual designs and different flavors to them, which would be enough to make them attractive, but their internal gameplay mechanics are so dramatically different from one another that you can spend ages playing as one character and really feel like you've got a good handle on the game, you understand the tactics, you understand the timing, you're getting good at it. You switch to another character, and so much of that stuff goes out the window. Yeah, you still have an understanding of the timing and the general feel of the game, but all of a sudden the way that you interact with the world around you is completely different, and you've got to learn how to do a whole bunch of stuff all over again. And that doesn't mean that you can't build on your previous skills, but it does mean that it's very, very difficult to get tired of this game and that every single game is going to feel very different because not only is your character different, but the way that they interact with whoever your opponent comes up with is going to be very different mechanically as well. This feels like not so much one game as a hundred different micro games in one giant box. And that's an absolutely wonderful experience.
The gameplay itself is also really engaging and really, really simple. I love how easy it is to introduce other players to this game. I've gotten people playing it within about five minutes. Uh, we've often done things like setting it up at conventions and just kind of leaving it out enticingly. And people will wander over and they'll be playing a full game before they even know it because it's just so accessible and so incredibly engrossing when you get into it. Which means that even though this is a two-player game, I've gotten it out in large groups. I've managed to play it with a whole bunch of different players because it's so fast, so easy, and so much fun. Yes, bang for buck, this box, BattleCon Devastation of Indians, has so much in it, you're going to be playing this game for a really long time if you're the kind of person who really enjoys two-player games. Now, I'm not really the kind of person who enjoys two-player games. I really appreciate this game. I love the amount of detail that went into it. I love the stuff that you get in the box. The fact that they didn't make you go out and buy expansions to get more characters means that I really, I really appreciate the designers here. I, I really love the fact that they went out and they did that. So you've got this game that's going to last you for a really long time. You're going to be playing it. You're going to be learning it. You're going to be switching it up over and over and over again. You're not going to get tired of it, and that's fantastic. Now, they do have a multiplayer version of the game in the box, of course, because everything seems to be in the box. Um, so there is an option for those people like me who aren't really into the two-player gaming, uh, and it's definitely worth trying. So give that a shot if you're not really a two-player gamer. So that was our top six games for season three. Hopefully that gave you some ideas of what to try out next. Thanks for watching. And seriously, the sheep are the cutest. Oh my god, the sheep.